Okay, let's take a look at um, modulus and density in a little more detail um, by looking at a, a, st a structured approach to determining what material is, is, uh, is best for a certain application. And so the application I want to look at is, and that was my helicopter sound, um, a, a helicopter rotor. Okay, so, I mean, this is a little model helicopter, but in fact, uh, the same, uh, very, some, some very similar loads are applied. So this, this thing here, the, the blade, if you will, it's called the rotor on the helicopter, what would be the best material to make this out of um, for, in fact, either this helicopter here or, or, or more realistically, a, a, a large one? Um, so let's take a quick, quick, quick look at that. Um, <clears throat> And so what I've got here, and we're going to return to, is a sketch again, as we had in the last video, of all the world's materials, metal, ceramics, and polymers, and some different subsets of polymers, you know, foams and elastomers, and uh, some composite materials, including natural ones like wood. And we're going to, you know, come to a con conclusion uh, that you know, there's certain ones that are best for, um, for this particular application. So let's take a look at that application here in a little bit more uh, detail. Okay, so we're going to say, well, the rotor is, um, how is it loaded? It's, it's, it's effectively a beam. It's loaded and bending. All right, it's loaded and bending. And why don't we go ahead and generalize the shape of the blade like this so that it's got a cross-sectional area and it has some length as well, okay? <clears throat> so we're not going to account for the complicated geometry of it, but in fact that for our purposes of selecting the material actually doesn't really... Um, doesn't really matter. So it's loaded and bending is what's important and it's a helicopter. So we want to um, specifically, we, we want to, if you will, if you write out the objective here, our main objective, not supposed to be an objective, would be to minimize mass. Not min, minimize mass. And what would the mass of this geometry be? Well, it would be mass would be equal to the area times the length times the density. There's our density, right? It's going to give us volume, mass per volume, so we're going to end up with mass. Um, but of course, we're going to have well, many constraints, but the one I want to look at here would be a constraint on the maximum amount of deflection, max deflection. Okay, and let me show you with our little model what I mean by that. So the rotors are sitting here like this, okay? and it starts to support the load of the helicopter. In fact, if I just take these two rotors and I hold the weight of this little model <laughs> helicopter, um, there you can see, uh, they're wobbly, you can see that they deflect. Okay, there you go, that's the def deflection I'm talking about. Now, if it deflected, even if that, that's just elastic deflection, right? But if under load it deflected so, like, you know, this much, well, it's throwing, going to be throwing air off to the side. It's not going to be efficient. It's not going to provide the lift it needs. So the design um, would, would stipulate some maximum deflection that you could permit in this blade. And that's the, the only thing for our purposes right now we're going to look at. So the deflection, and I don't expect you to just know this, but the deflection of a beam um, <coughs> um, loaded and bending is going to be, that's going to be it. FL cubed um, over some constant, which is going to depend on the specific um, cross section, divided by, there's the Young's modulus, and then some function here, uh, well, this is in, the area is introduced through the second moment of area, but we're, you know, it's not a beam mechanics course, so really I'm just giving you a general formula here for the deflection, and that is, as I said, that's the Young's modulus, okay, Young's modulus. And this is area. What's important is to see it's a function of the area squared, one over the area squared. Okay. Now, in um, in a beam, the length is stipulated by the design, but the area you could say is a is is um, the free variable. So we can isolate. What we do, the little technique we could do here is we could isolate for the area. So area 
then is going to be equal to um, FL cubed over that constant, the Young's modulus, deflection, and then that whole thing raised to the one half. Um, perhaps I should, just to be thorough, deflection. That's the deflection of, say, the tip of the beam, of the rotor. Okay, so there we go. Now what we can do, it's this neat, in this material selection um, approach, um, is, and, you know, and again, I'm using this as an illustrative purpose. You don't have to know exactly how to do all these steps for this course, but I think it demonstrates a really, really neat result um, in, in choosing materials for a certain application. Okay, so then <clears throat> what we can do is we can substitute that into back into our um, objective, um, which was again mass equal to area. Okay, so that's FL cubed over that some con that constant E deflection to the one half times length times density. Again, I'll just zoom back up to the top here for you so you can remind yourself. There we go. We have mass equal to area times length times density, but we've rewritten the area in terms of this constraint for deflection, and then we substitute that back in. And now, what we're doing, I'm not going to you know, go through a full robust treatment, but the interesting thing here is, is this. Look, if we look at the material properties, we've got e to the one half, and we've got rho, okay? So just the material properties that we want to look for would be we want to minimize rho over e to the one half or often instead of minimizing we like to maximize so we say we're going to maximize e to the one half over rho okay and <clears throat> We could even, in fact, call that, as, as sometimes we do, what we'll do is we'll, that term there, we'll call that, because that's derived for this specific application, we'll call that a material performance index. And we're only looking at the material performance here, or MPI. We say the MPI is e to the one-half over rho. Now what we could do, though, because we, we, in our at the very top of the, this, um, our, our work, we wanted to look at log e. Whoops, I have to clear that up. That's logarithmic, right? We're looking at log e versus log rho, aren't we? So what we can do then is take the log of both sides of this MPI equation that we have at the bottom. <clears throat> Go, and we'll take log that MPI equals one-half log e minus log rho. Now we want that in the form of a straight line, y equals mx plus b. So I'm just going to rearrange a little bit here. And we're going to plot e versus rho. So we're going to have, or log e rather. So we'll have log e <coughs> equals um, log rho. We're going to clear that fraction so it's 2 log rho plus 2 log mpi. So we have now a slope of 2 on our curve. We're plotting log e versus log rho. And the slope is 2. So now if we go back up to the top, this is beautiful stuff. This is great. All we need to do is say, all right, we could identify now, say there's 1, and we're going to get a rise of two orders of magnitude, so from point 0.1 to 1 to 10, and a run of one order of magnitude from 1 to 10, and there we have a line with a slope equal to 2, okay? And so the e to the 1 half over rho, anywhere along that line, is equivalent, and in fact, as the intercept is the material's performance index, if we increase that line, we move it up, we get better and better values or better and better materials. So you can see, I think it makes some intuitive sense, right? 
if we you know move along to higher and higher values here you know draw this along um, you will get better and better performance for this rotor which is really you could call it um, a lightweight stiff beam okay and so what's the best material going to be well I actually can draw this ideally um, woods would probably be a little bit below this um, and not have the requisite modulus um, um, Anyway, there will also be uh, some inconsistent properties, even if they did actually perform well. Although you can, it's interesting. You could see, you know, a model aircraft, a wooden aircraft, a little, you know, where the consequences of failure are low. Certainly, you can make a model aircraft from wood. It performs quite well. It's quite a lightweight, stiff material, uh, low cost. Uh, but if there was a minimum threshold, as there would be in this case on the modulus, you know, the modulus of wood less than 10 gigapascals wouldn't cut the cut. Um, wouldn't make the cut so you would eliminate wood you'd be left with some some technical ceramics perhaps in here and some composite materials the ceramics you'd exclude because well you don't want brittle fracture so you're going to rule those out because they're brittle and so what do you end up with well you you, you find that um, and here you have some high performance composite materials like carbon fiber reinforced polymer and that, in fact, is what you would use for um, a high-performance uh, rotor on a helicopter. Um, <clears throat> and there's other design considerations you could you could um, include if it's going to be flying in a sandy environment. And that rotating blade will get abraded by sand. You might want to put a high, uh, you know, a similar high uh, stiffness, lightweight material. Like in this region, you'd, probably, you'd have titanium. So, but it would have a better wear resistance than the carbon fiber. So you could put the leading edge. You'd put some titanium uh, alloy on the leading edge, and have a car carbon fiber uh, rotor. Anyway, that was a quick, um, qu very quick look at what can be a fairly complicated topic. But I think it's really interesting um, uh, way of, of, of looking at materials and material selection. And again, you know, moving up to this region here, it's unpopulated. Maybe some future research can start to give us new materials in that area. Thanks a lot. Okay, in the previous video, we, we discussed the fact that a lot of materials are crystalline. Um, in fact, that is certainly true. Here's a piece of uh, quartz. It's crystalline silica made of silicon and oxygen. You can see it's, uh, um, it certainly looks crystalline. It uh, doesn't have to be transparent. We'll cover that later. But it's got these, these faces, these facets on it, and that's actually representative of the arrangement of the individual atoms in, in that. Uh, here's a piece of pyrite. It looks like a beautiful little cube. And that's, again, representative of the way that the atoms are arranged at the atomic level. Um, here's a, a beautiful little piece of, of bismuth. Okay, I'll show you that here. I'm not sure how well that will show up on the camera, but it has a, certainly a very interesting, kind of curious uh, arrangement to, to it. And that is a function of the way the atoms are arranged at the atomic scale. If you poured some salt on the table, if you looked at an individual piece, you'd see it was cubic. And that's because the atoms are arranged with some cubic symmetry. Before we get into all that, I don't want you to think that everything is crystalline. So many materials are crystalline. Okay, many metals. So, uh, for example, um, in fact, I would say most of the metals that we deal with as engineers are crystalline, are highly organized. There's some important ones that are not. There's some glassy metals, bulk metallic glasses and stuff as well, but most metals that we use are crystalline, they're polycrystalline. Um, some ceramics, um, some ceramics, I'll say some ceramics, so for example, um, alumina, Al203, which is also called sapphire. It's crystalline, and if you've got a recent Apple uh, phone, uh, I found the, the cover here on the on the camera lens is actually a single crystal sapphire. Uh, it's optically transparent. It's a ceramic. It's really hard and scratch resistant. Um, but um, not not everything is not uh, not every every material is 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 crystalline. Not everything. 
So some things are um, disorganized. I should actually write this in there. I have to find a new term here. Some materials are amorphous. Okay, what does amorphous mean? Well, amorphous means not organized, or not crystalline. Okay, and an example of that uh, would be window glass. That's a classic example. Got these long, there's these molecules, and it's a very disorganized structure in there. Uh, that being said, there's some order to the molecule, and so oftentimes we'll differentiate between what we call long range order and let's say versus here, um, short range order. Okay, versus short range order. And what does that mean? Well, long range order has order um, well beyond nearest neighbor atoms. Okay, I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. And then short range order means that there's organization only at the level of the first or maybe the second neighbor, the nearest neighbor. Um, neighbor. Uh, whoops. Okay, so let me show you a little bit more what I mean about that. By, by that. Um, say we were to look at, well, like I did in the last video, I drew this simple two-dimensional lattice um, to represent a, a crystal, and I said, well, you know, you'd have, you could have atoms positioned in these regular positions throughout that lattice, maybe at the corners, like I've indicated here. And so this is an example here, and if this continued, you know, hundreds, thousands of atoms away, the, the arrangement of atoms continues well beyond just the nearest neighbor, um, versus, say, you know, if you had um, silicon with uh, you know, four oxygens around it or something like that. Well, and then this structure actually could repeat with shared oxygens um, and you form this, this large uh, molecule. Um, this is just a two-dimensional depiction, but you may know that this silicon is going to have what it has next to it, or in a hydrocarbon, you might have a carbon with hydrogen around it, a couple of hydrogens around it, but you only know the order at that nearest neighbor level. Um, say methane gas. I mean, they, you've got carbon with four hydrogens around it, and you know where the hydrogens are. You, in fact, know they, you may know they even have this tetrahedral symmetry. But beyond that, there's no order. So that would only be short-range order um, versus long-range order, which is what we're really talking about here, is uh, you know, crystallinity, highly organized um, materials. So what I'd like to do is show you an example of a highly organized material. And... <clears throat> an important one, and that is, um, it's called face-centered cubic. I'm going to write that in as a new terminology here, in orange color, face-centered cubic, or it's often just abbreviated FCC. So why is that important? Well, many metals have this, um, this arrangement of atoms. And um, it's also a good structure to become familiar with because we're going to see that it, we can use it as a foundation for understanding some ceramic structures, some semiconductor structures, um, and some of the symmetry that's, that we can learn in face center cubic shows up in organic molecules and stuff as well. So it's a really versatile structure to become familiar with. <coughs> so let's go ahead and draw a cube. What we're going to do is we're going to use that to understand how these atoms um, are arranged in a face center cubic material, like, um, for example, aluminum is face, uh, face center cubic. So here's a cube. I'll dash in the back there. Let's hit the lines so you can see the full cube. And so it's cubic. What we do is we start off by positioning an atom at each corner. Okay, but I'm going to just pause for a second there. How am I going to depict this? i got to be careful about that. If I were to go back up to this two-dimensional depiction we had here, 
and say zoomed in on just one of these little squares there. And say I wanted to represent this entire arrangement of, of atoms in two dimensions, but only use one little square to do it. Well, what I could do is just take the square, but take a fraction of the circle in two dimensions. I would take a quarter at each corner. And so I'm going to do a similar thing with my cube, but now that the cube is in three dimensions, the corner positions contain actually one-eighth of, an, of a full sphere. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try to draw in carefully. Now, I won't always, I won't always draw it this carefully, um, but uh, to first introduce the topic, I'm going to try to draw as if it was just a, uh, the, the fraction of the atom that it really represents. Okay. Going forward often, I just draw the little dot because it's it's a, it's a heck of a lot faster than what I'm doing right now. What I find when I'm first teaching the topic, a lot of times students really benefit from seeing it depict a little more carefully like this. And then there's the face-centered positions, so up in the top in the center of the face there, and then on the right side face in the center, on the front side uh, in the center, and then the opposites. So from the top, we have them down to the bottom. There would be one down here. From the front to the back, there's one in the back of the uh, center of the back face. And then the right would go all the way over to the left, and the counterpart over there would be on the left side face in the center position. <coughs> so each of these corners, as we mentioned, has one eighth of an atom or of a sphere. And there are eight corners. So we get one atom contributed from the corner positions within the cube only, right? And then there's one half of a sphere on the center position, and there are six faces, so we end up with three for a total of, in the FCC unit cell, four atoms within the cube. So now armed with that, it's actually interesting. What we can do is we can now calculate um, a property, and what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the, um, the density. So the density we addressed in the previous um, lecture should be the mass per unit volume. So could we calculate the density of, say, aluminum from this, uh, from knowledge that it has the FCC unit cell? Yeah, well, of course you could. And <clears throat> so it would be um, mass per volume. I'm going to write it down uh, right there. here so we have a bit of space. Okay. The density is going to be then equal to the number of atoms in the unit cell times how much each atom weighs. And what's that? Well, that's the atomic weight, or molar mass. Okay? And then we're going to divide by the volume of the unit cell. Now, to get the volume of the unit cell, I should specify that we define the edge length here of the cube as A. We call that the lattice parameter. Lattice parameter. And... This is the volume of the unit cell. Now, I just want to stop for a second here and look at the units that we've got so far. So we've got units of number, um, atomic weight, or molar mass, from the periodic table, has um, units of um, grams per mole. And then in the denominator there, we have the volume of the unit cell, which will have length when it's cubed. <coughs> So we look at this and we say, well, this is irritating. We're trying to get units for density of mass per volume, but we're, we're, we're not getting there. So what are you missing? Well, what has units of number per mole? Well, of course, Avogadro's number. So if we add Avogadro's number at the denominator, and then we get number per mole, the units work out. And this is our final equation. We've got uh, density units, grams per cubic meter in this case, which you could convert later. <coughs> Just something like grams per cubic centimeter. And so this is going to get a little red box because it's an important equation. And I will just complete this by identifying that that's the Greek letter rho. That is the volume of the unit cell. Just give myself a little bit more room here. The volume of the unit cell. This is, of course, the number of atoms in the unit cell. And 
that's Avogadro's number. So there you go. From just our knowledge of the crystal structure, we can now calculate the property like the theoretical density. Thank you.